I said this was not a safe space. You know, she's out here. She's Walter Whiting, um, all of Gilead, and she's got no Jesse Pinkman to stop her. Like, there is no balance. There is no one. I just... Uh, Without the tension of Serena with June or Offred, like, you have no show. So the more they keep the two of them separate, like, the less I'm interested. I either need to see them come together and fight the good fight, or I need to see them, like, cut each other and kill each other. I'm not interested in anything else. Because at this point, this Nordic track moment, I'm not here for. Like move the plot forward, end the show. Now, we know it's been renewed for a fourth season, obvi. And if you aren't aware, um, Margaret Atwood has actually written a sequel to the book, which will be published, I think, in September, and she's actually going to do an international, like, live stream, live reading of it. So I'm wondering if season four is going to work with this new source material or if it's just going to continue on its own trajectory. I don't know. I'm here for the show. I will be here for the show. Um, I think it's still one of the most important narratives on television. Everyone should be watching it. Um, you know, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. You should still be watching it. Um, but yeah, like I feel like season three was a bit of a just a run in place moment. So you guys can comment below. Oh. Next up on the docket, Michelle Carter. So I don't know if wait, is that her name? Yeah, it is. So, I don't know if you guys have seen the HBO documentary, um, it's been available, on, if you have Prime, it's on, well, if you have HBO via Prime, it's on there, but, um, the name of the documentary is I Love You Now Die, The Commonwealth versus Michelle Carter. Now, Michelle Carter is the young woman who on, and I'm, I'm going to be reading now just so I don't um, lose my mind. On July 13th of 2014, authority discovered, authorities discovered the body of an 18 year old boy named Conrad Roy III in his pickup truck outside a Kmart parking lot in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Um, he was an honor roll student. He struggled with social anxiety and depression. He had his own YouTube channel, which he was voicing these uh, issues on very publicly, um, ultimately uh, ended his life via carbon monoxide in said vehicle. Michelle Carter was his 17-year-old long-distance girlfriend, and she and he had a long-distance, completely long-distance, and exclusively via telecommunication, social media relationship. And she ultimately was put on trial because of the correspondence that came to light. And we know now that basically there were goings on where it's alleged that her, her correspondence with him may have pushed him over the edge. Um, but regardless, there was a moment when he had already gotten ready. He was in the truck. He had gotten out of the truck and was panicking and saying, I'm, I think I'm changing my mind. And she said, no, I'm paraphrasing here. You wanted this to happen. We've been working towards this. We've been working towards supporting you ending your own life. Again, this is Melissa's words. I'm paraphrasing. And because of her coaxing, and her reassuring or her whatevering, he got back in the truck and ultimately died. So she was put on trial. It's a two-part documentary on HBO. I highly recommend you watch it if you haven't. It begs so many questions um, that need to be discussed. So first and foremost, you have kids that are in high school, right? You have adolescents dealing with social anxiety in a world of social media which is something that I never dealt with. Um, I graduated in 2000. All of us had just gotten desktop computers. Like we all just like 
had Packard Bells and AOL.com and chat rooms. Like that was the extent of it um, whilst I was in high school. So you have a completely different paradigm of interaction with peers, right? Just, just, we're just gonna lay that right there. Um, what's interesting is the boy was very open about his depression and anxiety. He, again, he had a YouTube channel. Um, it was not a secret that he was not well. Um, his parents, as you will see in the documentary and in various other sources, you know, kind of claim to be unaware of how bad it was, right? Which is totally fair. And here comes this girl and apparently she doesn't have many friends. She's not very like socially accepted. Um, and she meets this boy online and they have this connection and they're like feeding into each other's pathologies. And you have this monster that's like growing and growing and growing and growing and growing and it's one of those monsters that many people are affected by and many people who have committed suicide have probably gone through similar circumstances where they've met somebody and the two entities the two personalities the two hearts minds souls whatever are feeding into each other and for better or worse, in most occasions for the worse, um, supporting each other's neuroses, pathologies, uh, some, and sometimes uh, sociopathy, psychopathy, psychosis, you know, all of these things. Anyways, I'm going off on a tangent. What's so interesting about the documentary and about this case is that there's no statute for it. The whole case was built upon the idea that can you have a quote unquote virtual presence insofar as can, if I'm not physically present when you harm yourself, but I'm virtually present via some sort of communication, am I still res as responsible for your actions as if I were physically present and coaxing you? It begs all these questions. This case had no statute on any on on any of these these issues. Like there was nothing. There was no precedent for any of this. So this idea of virtual presence is something that is very interesting and obviously more and more and more relevant by the second. Right? Like I've had conversations with people that are not well you know and people have had conversations with me when i've been really unwell and you know the conversation the topic can go to suicide very quickly and not in a i'm gonna do it kind of way but in a like we're talking about what that means what that looks like what you know ob like objectively not as a plan but just as a topic how quickly could some of my text messages or some of my emails be taken out of context if said person were to harm themselves or if I were to harm myself, excuse me, myself and that person's communications with me were taken out of context and they were put on trial. It's, it's a very, 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 very big, 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 huge conversation that needs to be had. Is virtual presence a thing? And regardless of if it is or isn't a thing, if you take a relationship out of context and much like these, these two kids, their relationship existed in a vacuum. No one had access to any of their communications until after the death. And then all of the texts and all the correspondence were made available to the authorities and the families and whatnot. There was no context. No one saw them interact because they didn't interact in real life. So what what does that mean? What does that mean if you are 
in an abusive relationship or you're thinking about self-harming or you're confiding in somebody, at what point does the person on the other end of the phone or whatever device you're using to virtually communicate with become responsible for your actions or not? I mean, it, it's absolutely crazy. Um, and then, you know, you have this, if you watch the documentary, you know, you're, you're, they're talking to the families, but there's one person on the documentary that just got it for me. And that was the reporter that covered the case. I can't remember the gentleman's name, but it was the young gentleman and, um, he had covered the case, I think pretty much straight up from the beginning. And he was the only one to kind of really tap into what was going on like underneath the legality underneath the morality underneath the media craze all of it and because you have like this whole kind of excuse me black widow malaise kind of hovering over it like you have this like witchy woman who's you know entranced uh excuse me entranced that's not a word enchanted or you know kind of hypnotized this boy with her femininity or her crush or her love for him or whatever so you have this kind of like black widow romanticization of the situation and i think that's unfair to her michelle carter and i think it's unfair to women in general um the Lorena Bobbitt documentary dives into that really deeply, but anyways, um, the the reporter was the only one to really kind of tap into what was like under the soil, like the kind of, you know, uh, I can't even. He basically said, and I quote, it's, it's not important why she did it, but what she thought she was doing. It's not important why she did it it's important what she thought she was doing this can be applied to pretty much any criminal activity obviously um some might find that a little too empathetic some might find that spot on i found it spot on i think that's like the perfect towing of the line uh especially as a journalist who's supposed to be object objective obviously but like I felt like it was the perfect towing of the line to approach any criminal or moral argument, right? It's not important why they did it. It's not important why they did it. It's important what they thought about what they were doing. This could be applied to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This could apply to the man's It goes on and on and on. That was so poignant to me because this girl and this boy in her mind it's very easy to vilify uh, as the public it's very easily easy to watch her or read the information if you were privy to you know the goings on live to be to vilify her you know why'd she do that like what the fuck is going on in her mind okay sure valid question but what's more important and what is like the second layer to the onion is like what did she think she was doing because i can tell you why i drink i can tell you why i self-sabotage i can tell you why i make a youtube video i can tell you why i read a book I tell you why i go to grad school i can tell you why i have a cat i can tell you why i like this and i like that and i do this and i don't do that fine great whatever but what's, you peel back that onion, that first layer of the onion, what do I think about that why? What do I think about what I was doing? So again, going back to the example of conversations that I've had with friends, friends very close to me, people very, very close to me in my life, family, friends, lovers, who have talked very seriously about depression, about suicide, about self-harm. If you were to take the why out of context, and you were to take that correspondence out of context, you could put anybody on trial, right? 
but without really asking what the person themselves on either end, the receiving end of the correspondence, you know, whatever the case may be. What do you think about the why? If you say I did this because X, okay, great. What do you think about why you did X? Like, there's just this whole other thing that never gets addressed in moral conversations, especially